Okay. Welcome, friends, for today's <coughs> lecture on Anibisan. The other day we completed up to here. We looked at um, Ramakrishna mission, Swami Vivekananda, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, and their active involvement in the secular movement in India. And today, let's continue the class from here, Nebisent. Reform movements in South India. So far, we have seen reform movements in North India, particularly in Bengal and Maharashtra. Uh, here, we look at this lady who started this uh, society called the Theosophical Society. Many Europeans were attracted to her Hindu philosophy. Even now, today, also, a lot of uh, Western individuals, communities, along with the Europeans, attracted to the Hindu philosophy. In 1875, a Russian spiritualist named uh, Madame Blavatsky and an American called uh, Colonel Alcott founded the Theosophical Society in America. The society was greatly influenced by the Indian doctrine of karma. So this Indian uh, philosophical Hinduism attracted crowds even in the middle and the late 19th century. So in 1886, these two individuals founded the Theosophical Society at uh, Adyar near Madras in India. Anibisen, an Irish woman who came to India in 1839, helped the Theosoph the Theosophist movement to gain strength. Under her leadership, this society started um, growing, particularly she is a woman from Ireland, Irish woman. She propagated Vedic philosophy and urged Indians to take pride in their culture. We have seen even those uh, reform, reformers like uh, uh, Raja Ramohan Rai and uh, Dayananda Saraswati, uh, all of those reform revi revivalists looked at Vedas. They said Vedas uh, don't talk about casteism and all those uh, ritualistic practices. Let's come back to Vedas. Even this theosophical society gave high priority to Veda, Vedic philosophy and urged Indian society to take pride in the culture. So the so theosophists stood for the revival of the ancient Indian religion and uh, universal brotherhood. In the religion and uh, universal brotherhood. The uniqueness of the movement lay in the fact that it was spurred by foreigners who glorified Indian religions and philosophical traditions. They were spearheaded by foreigners. A lot of foreigners were attracted to this Indian uh, philosophy, particularly the Karma philosophy. Anipisent was the founder of the Central Hindu College in Banaras, which later developed into the Banaras Hindu University. Now today in India, this is one of the outstanding universities, Hindu uh, Banaras Hindu University. Some of the books for this course, I could download from that university. So Banaras Hindu University, uh, the origin is here. This. Anibisent. Anibisent herself made India her permanent home and played a prominent role in Indian politics. Not only in religious and philosophical context, she also played a vital role in Indian politics. In 1917, she was elected president of Indian National Congress. Of course, you know, her contribution to 
Indian National Congress is significant. So the late and the next uh, we need to discuss about uh, Ramalinga Adi Galar, popularly known as Velala. Let's move from Anubisan to Velala. Samarasa Sutta, Sanmarga Sangham. Samarasa Sutta, Sanmarga Sangham. This is the moment came into existence. The Velala was the one who affirmed openly and clearly in an unmistakable language the deathlessness of his body, which he attained by the power of what he called Arthurm Jyoti. Arthurm Jyoti, the vast grace, light of the divine which he identified as the truth, light of knowledge. Truth, light of knowledge, Satya Gnana Jyoti. Call it as Satya Gnana Jyoti. So Samarasa Sutta Sanmarga Sangham gave priority to Satya Gnana Jyoti. So this movement, uh, particularly Velala's principles are unique in its teaching. Uh, the Velala propagated the universal brotherhoodness, teaching all souls are equal. There were a kind of revival movements these, crossing the barriers of caste, culture, and the geography, brotherhood, and treating all souls equal. Dalits and the Brahmins, all souls are equal. Creating awareness to individuals, self-discipline. You know, creating awareness to individuals, self-discipline. And then the third unique uh, teaching of this Velalar is that God is one for all. And worshiping, worshiping him as vast grace, light are Arthaparan Jyoti. Parut Param Jyoti, vast grace light. And the fourth one is no killing of animals and uh, no eating of flesh. No eating of flesh. How do we understand today, even in the movies, this, um, what is this? Um, Agora has become so famous now today. You know, people are so crazy to become Agoras. How do we interpret and well as preachings? No eating of flesh, no killing of animals. Jiva Karunya, showing mercy to hungry and feeding them. Jiva Karunya, Karunya, mercy. Showing mercy to the hungry, feeding the hungry is important to Velala. So feed them the hunger. Velala's great principle for spiritual enlightenment was thus three things. One is remain hungry, remain alone, remain awake. Remain hungry so that you understand the hunger of the world, remain alone and remain awake. It's really funny, the other day I was watching the news, I think it was an interview with a, a journalist by this um, Tamil superstar, what is his name? Uh, Rajinikant. You know, the, the journalist asked him, what is the secret of your health? You are very old, but still you look like young. How are you man managing this uh, smartness? He gave three principles. He said, eat less, sleep less, and uh, work hard. I don't know what is the secret of um, remaining hungry. It means eating less. That means always, no, even our elders always say, at least there should be some space in our uh, stomach. You should have some kind of space. And in those days, people used to eat only when they were hungry. Only two times a day, uh, early morning, people get up and go to the field, work, and land on, land in between 11 to 12, they used to eat. And night come back at seven o'clock, they eat and sleep. No breakfast, nothing. But the modern eating is we eat 
even if we, there is no hunger inside, there is no alarm of hunger. We never, most of the times people never knew what is hunger. So here, well, our principles are unique. Remain hungry, remain alone, remain awake. What is Suddhas and Margam? Now let's understand uh, Velalar's uh, Suddha San Margam. San Margam means the true Marga. So sud Samsara Suddha San Marga Sangham is a universal evolutionary principle movement cre created by Swami Ramalingam in the 1867. So it is a fellowship for the path of truth, purity, the right means satya dharma and harmony. Satya dharma and harmony. So technically, it is the path of vast grace light. Say grace, light yoga. And signs of evolution and progressing towards attaining the evolutionary deathless divine physical body on the earth itself. Deathless physical body on the earth itself. It is impossible. I haven't seen anybody deathless physical body on the earth itself. So evolutionary deathless divine physical body on the earth itself was the trend. The true followers of Sutta Sanmarga are only those the qualifications to be in this moment. Who are the true followers? Who have abandoned the ways of religion and philosophies, which are the chief impediments to the Sanmaga. The Sanmaga that was introduced by this, you know, uh, if there is any principles and uh, religious philosophies that hinder them, they should not go. They should not believe them. And the other one, who is the true follower of Sanma, Suddha Sanmaga number two, who have by intuitive knowledge, the intuitive knowledge protected themselves by rejecting anger, sex, etc. when they invade. Another intuitive knowledge to reject the anger and the sex. And number three, who have desisted from violence by killing and eating nominal food, animal food. They can, they can save themselves from desire, again, fear, again, fear, suffering and death. That is to say, they who by a good effort of discipline protect themselves from the phenomenal qualities of nature, can avoid death by accident or any sudden cause due to the influence of planetary motions. The planetary motions. By simply remaining here at the place of the Swami's living, one cannot save himself from death. When grace manifests itself, one can experience the bhogas or enjoyments of the world. Bhoga, sukha bhoga means a kind of you know, uh, legitimate pleasure according to the conditions of his purity, but not automatically the knowledge, powers of the higher world. Para loga bhoga gnana siddhis. Paraloga, bhoga, gnana siddhis. These are the paraloga, bhoga, gnana siddhis. Those who follow these principles. So reform movements among the Muslims. We have seen reform movements among the Hindus. And now let's look at the reform movements among the Muslims. Movements for socio-religious reforms among the Muslims emerged later on. One of those movements, most Muslim uh, Muslims feared that Western education would endanger their religion as it was an un-Islamic un in character. Like Hindus, Muslims were also suspicious about the Western education, thinking that they, 
the education is un-Islamic in character. During the first half of the 19th century, only a handful of Muslims had accepted English education. A lot of superstitious, you know, uh, their beliefs prevented the individuals to accept the English education. But the Muhammadian literature society established by Nawab Abdul Latif in 1863 was one of the earliest institutions that attempted to spread modern education. We are discussing about modern movements and the secular movements and the religious movements. So Nawab Abdul Latif was the first one who established this institution, Muhammadian Literature Society, Society. This is the first society accepted modern English education. Abdul Latif also tried to remove social abuses and promote Hindu Muslim unity. Look at it here. Hindu Muslim unity. Latif also tried to remove social abuses within the Islamic context and he promoted Hindu Muslim unity. And the, and the great movement that we need to talk about uh, among the Islam is Aligarh movement by Syed Ahmad Khan. Aligarh movement contributed so much to the Muslim community in India. The most important socio-religious movements among the Muslims came to be known as the Aligarh movement. So it was organized by Syed Ahmad Khan from 1817 to 1899, a man described as the most outstanding figure among the Muslims. Syed Ahmad Khan was born in 1817 in a Muslim noble family and had joined the service of the company as a juridical officer. He realized that the Muslims had to adopt themselves to British rule because he understood the value of English education and the British rule. So Syed Ahmad advised Muslims to embrace Western education and take up government services. There were superstitious beliefs that prevented Muslims to get into the government uh, services because in those days, government services, you know, particularly the army, the Muslim had to get into the army and there are so many, you know, their uh, religious uh, beliefs uh, prevented them. But here, Syed Ahmad Khan advised Muslims to get into uh, government services and accept the Western education in 1862. He founded a scientific society to translate English books on science and other subjects into Urdu. See, look at here. He not only motivated people to get Western education, particularly the English education, he also started translating books into Urdu. He also translated an English Urdu journal through which he spread the ideas of social reform. As we have been studying, the social reforms got into the cognitive minds of the Indian peasants and the educated by the literature. Literature plays a wider role in any moment. Through his in initiative, particularly through this uh, um, Syed Ahmad Khan's initiative, um, established the Muhammadian Oriental College, Muhammadian Oriental College, which later developed into the Aligarh Muslim University. See, education played a vital role in uh, modern movements. Aligarh Muslim University today it is, um, it, it is one of the outstanding universities in India. It helped to develop a modern outlook among its students. This intellectual movement is called the Aligarh movement. This is about the, all this intellectual movement is called as Aligarh movement. As a social reformer, Syed Ahmad Khan emphasized against the further system, polygamy, and the Muslim system of divorce. 
Even today, the Indian government is bringing so many bills into the parliament to abolish all this further system and the divorce, uh, the Islamic uh, system of divorce. It is still existing very much. But look at long, long ago, Syed Ahmad Khan tried to bring some revolution in this further system, polygamy, and the Muslim system of divorce. He emphasized uh, the need for removing irrational social customs while retaining the essence of Islam and encouraging a rational interpretation of the Quran. It's not an allegorical interpretation, but the rational interpretation of the Quran. Sayyid Ahmad Khan believed that the interest of the Muslims would be best served through cooperation with the British government, uh, with a kind of an uh, association of the British government. He, it was also through the guidance of the British that India could mature into a full-fledged nation. So he opposed the participation of the Muslims in the activities of the Indian National Congress. <laughs> you know, now he, uh, believe that the British Raj has brought so much development and the revolution in Indian in India. So he had in, he didn't support the Indian National Congress and its freedom struggle. Reform movements among the Sikhs and Pharisees. We have looked at the reform movements among the Hindus, and we have looked at the reform movements. A few, not all, among the Muslims. And now let's look at the reform movements among the Sikhs and the. Parsis, Parsis, religious and social movements among the Sikhs were undertaken by various gurus who tried to bring about positive changes in the Sikh religion. Uh, Baba Dayal Das uh, propagated the Nirankara, meant formless idea of God. Now God is understood as uh, Sarguna and uh, Nirguna. Akara and Nirankara. So here, Baba Dayal Das propagated the Nirankara idea of God. By the way, everything is okay. Can you hear me, Brother Hibbert? Yes, yes. Okay. So yes. the Nirankara idea of God. By the end of the 19th century, a new reform movement called the Akali movement was launched to reform the corrupt management of Gurudwaras. In, in any religion, reformation is essential. In any religion, we see some kind of corruption. There was a corruption at the temple's Gurudwaras. So this Akali movement was launched to reform the corrupt management of Gurudwaras. So the Parsi Religious Reform Association was started in 1851 a campaign against orthodoxy in religion. That's about uh, six and uh, Parsi reform movements. Let's move to the Christian reform movements, uh, particularly the Jesuits. Jesuits are members of the Society of Jesus. They're called SJ, the largest religious congregation of, for men in the Catholic Church. There's a religious congregation for men. That's why you see in Jesuit movements, you see brothers, hardly you see sisters. The Society of Jesus was founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola, a Spanish soldier who, like most men of his time, initially dreamed of bravery, fame, wealth, and beautiful women. But while he was trying to recover from the injuries he suffered after being seriously wounded in a battle. The books he read completely transformed him. He wanted to serve God, not the king. Later on, when he had that great darshan, he wanted to serve God. The Society of Jesus, SJ, is a worldwide organization of religious men, numbering about 22,000 spread over the world of whom over 3,000 are working in the province of India. 
even in that modern era, this Jasud missionaries, brothers, almost 3,000 out of 22,000 were in India. In Tamil Nadu alone, there are about 500 Jasud working in schools and colleges, youth services and social work centers and parishes and mission outreach programs and in almost every form of service and ministry associated with the church. So Francis Xavier, part of the missions, you know, he, uh, the Jesuit presence on the Indian subcontinent dates back to the arrival of St. Francis in Goa on 6th May, 1542. Even in the 16th, 16th century, this um, Jesuit missionary landed in India. In the Tamil country, St. Francis Xavier and his companions worked in the pearl fishery coast, Mylapur, and in other parts, Mylapur, and in other parts of India, particularly the work among the fishermen. Uh, even today, you see Francis Xavier's uh, dead body at Pune in the Catholic Church, hanging in a glass, uh, his body is still an evident and a historical evident for his witness in India. He preached the gospel and planted the Catholic Church. The whole of India, including the Tamil country, was part of the Goa province during that time, having St. Francis Xavier as its first provincia. After Francis Xavier came Antony Criminali. 1522 1549, who was later killed by the Badagas in a raid near Vadala, Ramnath district of Tamil Nadu. Later, Henry Hendrix, 1520 to 1600, Don Carlo Fernandez, Robert de Noble in 1577 to 16. Uh, 56, another was sent from Goa to the Tamil region to continue the work of evangelism. So, after Robert de Nobili, 122 Jesuits worked in the Madurai mission till 1759. Among them are courageous, or holy men like St. John de Brito, Marte de Oriolo. Ramna district and Tamil Nadu. The renowned Tamil scholar, Constantine Joseph Banchi, who is known by the Tamil name he adopted, Vera you are. So <coughs> as we continue the class, let's uh, look at the women reformers uh, within this society. You know, Pandita Ramabai is another Woman reformer. The British government did not take substantial steps to educate women. We are looking at the reformers within the Christian community. Pandita Ramabai made a great reformation in our modern India. That's the reason she was also one of one among the modern uh, reformers. Still, by the end of 19th century there were several women who had become aware of the need for social reform. Pandita Ramabai had been educated in the United States and in England, by the way. She wrote about the equal treatment meter meted out to the women of India. She founded the Arya Mahila Sabha in Pune. Arya Mahila Sabha in Pune and opened the Sarada, Sarada Sadhan for helping destitute widows. Sarada Sadhan. Sarada Sadhan means uh, helping Sarada, Sarada society. It's a Sarada Sadhan. Yeah, Sarada Sadhan. Sarada Sadhan. Sarada. It's a little pronunciation. Yeah, it's a little pronunciation different between Hindi and English. <clears throat> Sarojini Naidu. 
the other great reformer whom we need to recollect. Sarojini Naidu was a renowned poet and social worker. She inspired the masses with the spirit of nationalism through her patriotic poems. Through her patriotic poems. She stood for voting rights for women and took an active interest in the political situation in the country. She also helped to set up the All India Women's Congress. All India Women's Conference. And the literature and the press. If you look at the literature and the press, uh, literature was used as a powerful weapon for spreading social awareness among the people. It, all, it was also used for promoting social reforms. The social reforms made valuable contributions to literature. Bharat Hindu Harish Chandra, Bankim Chandra Chitaji, Chattopadhyaya, and uh, Rabindranath Tagore spread the ideas of social reform and condemned social injustice in Hindi and Bengali. Poets like uh, Iqbal, Subramanya Bharati inspired the masses. Prem Chen wrote about the suffering of the poor and thus made the people away of social injustice. You can read all the literature, it is available on online. Prem Chen, Iqbal, and uh, Subramanya Bharati, and all those uh, people's uh, powerful literature. Rabindranath Tagore particularly composed the national anthem that we will sing today. Bankin Chandra Chitaji, the Iqbal, composed two other national songs. Bande Mataram and Sare Jahas Acha. So, growth of the press, printing press, most reformers started journals of their own. That's the reason writing has been power in society. Through these journals and newspapers, they put forward their demands for social, economic, and political changes. Thus, the press acted as a vehicle for disseminating ideas of social transformation. Thus, the press acted as a vehicle for disseminating ideas of social transformation. So the characteristics of the reform movement, so we are concluding the lecture today, the characteristics and analysis of the reform movements of the 19th century brings out several common features. Number one, all the reformers propagated the idea of one God and the basic unity of all religions, one God, and the basic unity of all religions. Thus, they try to bring the gulf between different religious beliefs. There is a huge gulf between the religions, among the religions, on the basis of their concept of God and, um, and the plurality of their religious beliefs. So the characteristics of the reform movements are this. So they propagated about the idea of one God and the unity of all religions. All the reformers attacked the priesthood, rituals, idolatry, and polytheism. The humanitarian aspect of these reform movements was expressed in their attack on the caste system and the custom of child marriage. Most of these reformers, as we have studied all of them from the Hindu reformers, Christian reformers, Muslim reformers, Sikh and Parsi reformers, all of them, the human humanitarian aspects of these reform movements was expressed 
humanitarian concerns. They attack the caste system and the custom of child marriage. But hardly we see Protestant Christians have any reformers who fought against this caste system. Hardly we have any Protestant reformers. Of course, we had reformers in the Catholic Christianity, but we have so many evangelists, revivalists. Revivalism is understood among the Christians as only spreading the gospel, but not bringing a quality of holy life and the reformation of the society. Somewhere it is neglected. We are just discussing. So now, evaluating these the characters of the reformers. Now, number three, the reformers attempted to improve the status of girls and women in society. They all emphasize the need for female education. All the reformers emphasize the need for female education. By attacking the caste system and untouchability, the reformers helped to unify the gospel of India, people of India, into, the, into one nation. Attacking the caste system and untouchability. Caste system and untouchability. The reform must help to unify the people of India into one nation. Today, still we are in the need of reformers in any caste, in any, any religion, in any society, because still these evil practices are vibrant in our Indian society. Casteism is very much prevail. Of course, uh, unseen untouchability is very much prevail now. Untouchability of today is not on the base of caste, but on the base of class. The rich associating only with the rich. So there is a great need for the reformers in this 21st century. The reform movements of the modern era fostered feelings of self-respect, self-reliance, and patriotism among the Indians. Self-respect, self-reliance, and patriotism among the Indians. These are variations. Self-respect leads to uh, uh, growth in the society. Self-reliance, depending on yourself and the patriotism among the Indians. So contribution of the reform movements, if we, we have just evaluated and then their contribution, let's look at their contribution. Many reformers like uh, Dayananda Saraswati and Vivekananda upheld Indian philosophy and culture. They contributed to Indian philosophy and culture. This instilled in Indians a sense of pride and faith in their own culture. Female education was promoted by these reform movements. Uh, schools for girls were set up by these reform movements and uh, even medical colleges were established by women. This led to the movement development through slow of girls education. Though slow, though it was very slow, but it has contributed for the education of the girls. The culture, cultural and uh, ideological struggle taken up by the socio-religious movements helped to build up national consciousness. National consciousness. They thus paved the way for the growth of nationalism. The modern movements paved the way for the growth of nationalism. This is about the modern movements, their contribution, and their, uh, uh, we have just looked at a few of their um, setbacks and we have evaluated them in a more objective manner. Thanks for watching this class. Join us back again and subscribe to this channel. Okay. Any